What's up, guys? This is Dennis Panyuta. I have the honor of running an interview with my friend Juan Gabriel, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his story of becoming a game developer as well as becoming a teacher in game development and then even going into starting his own company in game development. So, um, yeah, this is my first interview that I've ever done. So please be uh, patient with me and uh, give me some <laughs> tips if you want me to become better at it. So, uh, Juan, why don't you introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, sure. As you mentioned, I'm Juan Gabriel Gomila. I'm from Spain, from a small island that probably, you know, it's Mallorca. I know you've been there quite the, a few times and you had a great time with us here. And well, I'm not a developer, really. I'm a, I'm a mathematician who happened to like video games. I really like playing video games. And after finishing my degree and getting my master's in teaching education, I found out that it was really difficult to get into teaching here in, in Spain because there was no place to go and, and teach unless you had some connections over there. So I really found out that this was the perfect moment for uh, learning more about this thing that was my passion. Well, video games, isn't it? So I learned about uh, coding. I had to learn about iOS, about Android. It was quite straightforward for just one person to create an application, to do a small, simple video game and launch it on the App Store. You didn't need, you know, these super big licenses worth millions of dollars, like in the old years of PlayStation or Xbox series. So that's what I did. I just launched my first applications, my first video game, and I got my first real job. I got paid for the applications I, I launched. What happened after that? Well, uh, there was... Uh, a company over there, a video game company here in Mallorca, who was looking for developers. And in that case, they contact me. I, I just lent them a CV and they found out what did I, uh, what I have launched during the, the last months. And the question was, how many years have you been doing that? And my answer was that, just three months, the last three months, you're hired. Wow. And that's how I really got into the, the game development world from wow. there. Because of my background in mathematics, I moved to the data science stuff, not so focused on, on really creating a game, but more analyzing and converting, monetizing the game and all those things. And soon after that, I started publishing in my blog some stuff about uh, how to analyze behaviors on a, on a video game, how to understand the KPIs, what's the meaning behind all that stuff. And I had the chance to go and give some some talks in London, in Germany and all that stuff with big video game studios like King, like Square Enix, different studios that were sharing the stage with me and uh, giving different analysis of, of video games. So every time I came to Mallorca back, I had an offer on the table from one of these super huge companies. And my boss over there told me, hey, guy, if you stay with us, uh, we will raise the pay amount that they are willing to offer you. So imagine I was earning the same I would have earned in Square Enix or in King, but I was here in Mallorca. So nice. it was <laughs> the dream of the night, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely a great place to be. All right. Yeah. That, so that's something, uh, one more thing, that that's something that just went into my mind and that's something that developers need to have in mind if if your boss is willing to pay you more as soon as he is afraid to lose you why is not offering you more on the first time why you need to go up to that stage isn't it well so that's... i can i can tell you why because you yeah, can save really... the money right <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah that's a, that's a very good reason but that's something that i i kept thinking about during this last year at the, at the company and that was the reason why I decided to, hey, why don't you go out there, teach the other people how to do what you've learned for yourself? Because my degree in mathematics or my master in teaching, it was not really the reason why I finish up in that job or giving those conferences. So that's the reason why I quit. I started teaching on Udemy as, as you. I, I started back in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I just started teaching the same technical things I've learned. Uh, coding in iOS, in Android. After that, people told me, hey, you know about video games, do Unity courses or Unreal courses, or you know about mathematics, teach mathematics, data science, artificial intelligence. And well, some years after that, 
here I have, here am I, isn't it? Yeah. And now you're the number one on uh, the Spanish market on Udemy, aren't you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's congratulations true. Congratulations on that, yeah. So that's really a, a huge achievement. Uh, Spanish market is also a big one, right? So let me quickly uh, show your page. So you're going probably not to see it, but uh, the no viewers will see it. So here you can see he has a total of 600,000 students now. Um, even though 330,000 are his own students that he acquired himself. So you can see here everything in beautiful Spanish written and 104 courses, man, you are working your ass off. That's <laughs> really incredible. You can see also highly rated courses. So people love his stuff. So if you know Spanish, definitely check out his courses here on Udemy. And um, yeah, so, so that's uh, a bit of a summary of what you've been doing. So now let, let's go into specific parts of that. Okay. So you gave us a little introduction to your background, but um, you also said how you start with the with game development, but in terms of game development, so you had this you have this passion of games, and what are the games specifically that you love, and where you thought, okay, well, let, let's start with that. What was your first game that you can remember that you played and enjoyed? Probably it was nineteen ninety two, nineteen ninety three, and it was Super Mario from the NES. You remember All right. that? Yes, of course. Super yeah. Nintendo. Super Mario Brothers. One, two, or three. Do you recall? For the Super Nintendo, it was a bundle that came with all the versions so far from the uh, the 80s and the last version from for Super Mario World. I remember that one particularly interesting. It was the Donkey Kong Time also, or the first 3D games that, well, not 3D, but isometric, you know, mm -hmm. that were starting to become popular. And yeah, I remember them quite in a in a nostalgic way in fact i still have my super nintendo over here at home and sometimes wow. it's just a matter of putting some of this cartridge and remember the old time and blowing first right you have to blow the cartridge first yeah sure you can play. <laughs> yeah 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 i think that's universal that that's in every universal. part of the world you yeah. needed to blow those cards yeah exactly yeah i never had a had one of those i had an atari but one a russian one when i was a okay. kid yeah, it was. I had this cartridge with uh, 9,999 games, and okay. most of the games were basically just a level of another game. So, so you could just select, uh, let's say, a Super Mario World Five or whatever, right? Instead of uh, starting it from the scratch. All right, and um, so this these were the beginnings of, of um, your passion for games, and you got one from your parents as a kid, then. Yeah. All right, and th uh, did they uh, stop you from playing too much? Not really. I I really love playing, but there, there's been something that's been my passion all, all my life on top of that, and that's mathematics. I remember when I started going to school and I got my book on, of mathematics, in just three, four weeks, I was able to do all the exercises of the book. And I was just, you know, five, six years old, something wow. like that. So teachers needed to stop me from learning more stuff on mathematics, which... It's not really something good to say, but uh, I made the work a lot more difficult in that case. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I learned too much about mathematics when I was quite young. And that's when I started uh, thinking about mathematics in other parts of the of the life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. well, well, later on, I, I became a developer or I started programming. For me, it was just a game because it's what I've been doing so far all my life. For instance, when I played or say something... Gran Turismo or, you know, Final Fantasy, something like that. I wasn't just playing the game. I was just thinking about, okay, what are the stats do I need to maximize in order to improve my characters or win the race in Gran Turismo? And it was the way I, I was playing. And that's the reason why later on I really like game design or I really like the game analytics stuff. Mm. So I still do it nowadays. All right. <laughs> and that's why you probably also love RPGs, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the reason why I really love them because there's so many stats and the way they interact with each other. It's it's like a whole world. It's yeah, I always tell my students that it's it's like when you're becoming a game designer to plan what what will be happening on a game, you just become the god of that game. You design the rules, you become the big man over there. So uh, that's something it's really interesting to do if you like mathematics plus video games. Mm, nice. And uh, what would be the, the your favorite RPG game? 
Well, probably one of the first I played is uh, the Final Fantasy VII. I think I've got the character over there. Yep. Yeah. Cloud there, Strife. You there remember is that? Cloud Strife. It? Yeah. It was really interesting because the balance between the story and the gameplay was super well. Mm -hmm. There was always a lot more stuff to learn or a lot more things to to do in that game. Back in the nineties, there was there was no no trophies, no achievements. There was nothing to guide you to do special stuff like it is nowadays. But despite that, I really like doing that by myself, learning, okay, what will happen if I do this or I do that on the game? And it was just a super well-designed game. So this is one of the best ones I remember from yeah. my old days. Yeah, and from the RPG, like from the mathematical point of view, the fact that you can level up every single materia, it's also like, I, that was something where I thought, wow, that's insane. Like the even the um, well, I don't know the names of the material because I played it in Rush uh, in, in in German. I didn't play it in <laughs> in English. But then this one where you have to get the golden chocobo in oh, order yeah. to then travel on the onto this island in order to get this uh, the twelve um, knights. Yeah, that, that was insane. Like oh, that, that game is uh, lovely. Yeah, great story, great art, uh, great um, game design in general. Their Square, Square Enix has done a great job. And that's why you also uh, considered to work for Square Enix, didn't you? Yeah. When they approached me after the conference over there in London and, and they tell me, hey, we've got a position over there. Come work with us on, on London. Was the office in London back in the time? Mm -hmm. uh, I really thought about that because as a kid, that was a company I, I grew up with. And mm -hmm. I really loved the games from from this company so for me it was just an honor that they just considered tell me hey there is a position come with us something like that yeah nice and then you stayed in spain however right you stayed yep. because you love your your mallorca which is a great place to be huh it's difficult you've been there quite some times and you know that once you come here you you've got nice weather you got super nice and fresh food it's really balanced the pricing of the stuff against the quality what you get you know it's not like you need a lot of money to, to live here with a fair amount of salary it's it's good and well you've got the people you've got the family you've got a little bit of everything grown on all the days and it's, so that's probably the one of the reasons why i stayed over there all right yeah i totally understand that i mean that's that's something that i uh i really am a little sad about in terms of my my life because I was not living in a as, as a kid I didn't live in a place where I wanted to stay for the rest of my life oh. so that's why I, I always had to I was moved somewhere else so I've, I've been moving around every three years I couldn't I didn't stay anywhere longer than three years after I moved out of my parents place because I just never uh, had this home you know now, now it seems more like I, I found it um, but yeah let's let's get back to to the uh, to a specific question so here how is teaching online versus teaching at the university because um b before you go into that question maybe you can tell a little bit more about your um university specifically like how you teach taught there how you even got into teaching at university yeah well before the pandemic came it was it was just a, another world i mean for me teaching at the university was one option when I when I left the company, I mean, when I really left the video game company, I was one of the guys with the highest salary over there. And I just went to nothing because I, I just first launched my first course on Udemy and I was just making, you know, $50, $100 a month. So it was yeah. just having everything to go to nothing to start from scratch. So for me at the beginning, it was just a way of at least have a fair salary. It's not too much, but it was... Uh, a first uh, way of not going back to zero. Plus, for me, was the way of improving my teaching. I mean, when you teach online, despite you can have in your mind who will be behind the scenes, you don't know who will be after the monitor. You don't know if you will teach a, a guy that will understand you, that will like your jokes that will even get bored after two or three lessons. That's something you don't get the feedback. And when you get it, it's probably too late because the guy yeah. is already bored, has already left you one star review, yeah. or he doesn't want to hear you about you anymore. So for me, my feedback or my quality control was teaching at the university because you see the faces. 
you see how they respond you see how they interact with you if the if your jokes are good or you need to change the topic for me even was the way of adapting all the knowledge i had to new stuff for instance i remember that when i started teaching well the classical stuff about uh, algebra or calculus and all that stuff are quite boring exercises so i tried to translate that into some more fun scenarios like game of thrones or like you know uh, the lord of the rings more freak stuff and there was just one girl at class that one day mentioned hey you're always putting male stuff on your questions why you don't put christian gray over there christian gray rocks so, okay i don't know who that guy is i needed to read the books just to get <laughs> into the mood of you know adjusting my my stems of the questions for what this particular scenario and that is something i have keep doing during the last years and this is interesting because this is the kind of feedback that an online teacher needs just to get sure that the courses he or she creates are not just for himself but are for the rest of the world and this is something really important yeah yeah well having the the live feedback is definitely well has to be a huge advantage because i, I have not had this experience I've, um, well, the, the biggest that I have done in terms of teaching was explaining my uh, peer students at university certain concepts that I understood before they did. And uh, that was pretty much it. But then I saw. Started... So I think that when you come back here to Mallorca, I will arrange so you can give one talk to Ooh. students at the university. That and you will exciting. feel the adrenaline. You will, feel, you, you will see that having an audience over there and seeing their faces hopefully without their masks, so you can see not just the eyes, but yeah. their expression. It really changes your, your way of thinking about your future courses or your future talks, even your, your directs or your videos on, on YouTube, because you start planning about, okay, what will the face of the guy behind the screen will look like? How can I make feel him to like this topic like I like it, isn't mm -hmm. it? So... It's really something you need to experience, and don't worry. I, we will arrange a nice. a nice topic here All right. when you come back. Well, I can feel the adrenaline rushing into my blood already. Well, <laughs> 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 definitely, uh, I would definitely love to do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so you you did teaching um, before you started online, and you could then use that in order to become better online. But how do you feel about the general uh, progression over years? Because this is not so just something that will be relevant for people who want to teach, but like just the general idea of getting better at whatever it is, at whatever your job is, if it's game development, app development, or mm -hmm. something entirely differently. Because at the beginning, you always start from well near zero. Of course, you have a certain background already, which helps you with this stuff. but you always have to be fine not knowing everything. And yeah. as a teacher, that's even more difficult because like people are asking you constantly things that you don't know yet. And um, so how, how would you say, or what kind of advice could you give someone who's a beginner and who has this journey of becoming good ahead of him? In fact, uh, do you call it the imposter syndrome, isn't it? Yeah, I created a video on that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, re I remember I saw that. So I think that you never leave that feeling of the imposter syndrome. I mean, I've been doing video games or I've been, you know, working in mathematics and I still have a lot more things to learn. So this is something that people don't need to be afraid about. So, yeah, if you're starting on a new stuff, either it's teaching, learning Kotlin, learning video games, and you feel that you don't know anything, that's okay. When you are a senior on that, there will still be some more APIs to explore, some more new concepts, or even technology will just change and you will need to start from scratch. For instance, in, in Unity, we've been using object-oriented programming for thousands of years, but now this data-oriented stack, this dots library is making us just think different about the way we code. That's okay. Um, uh, as long as we keep learning and improving ourselves, this is something or that feeling that in our guts is something that will always be over there. So mm -hmm. how to face it? There is a lot of ways of doing that. I've seen people that really fears teaching and they still teach at the university that they know, you know, they have 
some skinning over there or a change in the color of their skin because of the nerves they feel to teach something they are not 100% comfortable with. Mm -hmm. The way I, 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 I lead that is really simple. Okay, if there's something I don't know, I can talk to the students. I say, okay, this is something I don't know, but don't worry. For tomorrow or for the next day, I will investigate if there's a way of doing this or what's that or, or this other way. We, we need to understand that the teachers, we are not gods. We do not have 100% of the knowledge. There is mm. a lot more things. Yeah, and there, there is a, a nice joke here in, in, in Spain that I, I, I say to my students. That is, I get paid for what I know. And you know why? Because if someone needed to pay me for what I don't know, I would be a millionaire. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that's what people need to think about. You have your knowledge, you want to expand it and don't need to be afraid. Always being on the limit, always wanting to learn a little more and improve yourself as a developer, as a teacher, as a learner, I don't care. That's good because that will keep you like leveling up in Final Fantasy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I just, when you talked about different APIs and the new uh, dots thingy in Unity, I, some, a thought came into mind, and that is that beginners actually have an advantage because of that. Because what they can do is they can learn the hot new thing and they can get good at that particular thing very quickly. And even though they might not have the five years of or 10 years of experience in a particular field, but they have half a year of experience in this new field, which is what is really what people need. And then this half a year of experience becomes suddenly worth a lot more because of that, right? And there will always be new APIs, as you say. There will always yeah. be a new approach of doing things. Maybe a new engine even pops up in the future. Maybe Unity will not be the thing. And then you are one of the first ones to become really good at it. And your expertise becomes super important and valuable to a specific company. I mean, Godot, for example, is also an option, right? So if you're using that as a game developer, there are far less uh, developers there. But if a company has decided to use this engine and you come in and help them, they will value you a lot more than, well, if you had just five years of experience in Unity maybe, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I, that's something to have in mind that the less polluted we are in a technology or in a topic, the more willing we are to open ourselves to, to learn this new stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so... You've been on Udemy now since 2015, right? So that's almost six years and you've progressed over time. And now what would you say is the, the uh, well, what would be the best three courses that you have created? I think that the latest one on Python, R, machine learning and artificial intelligence are the ones that I enjoy the most because this is a topic I needed to really study because that was something I hadn't learned from my degree, but it was really well related with mathematics. So I would say something like that. Python or gamifying that learning experience about how to code. I remember the last, the last course I created with Python just three, four months ago. It's an adventure on pirates. So Python, pirate, you just become a pirate. And oh, okay. <laughs> as, as, as soon as you keep progressing, your pirate does. So for instance, at the beginning, your pirate has no money. Your pirate needs to learn how to collect money. And collecting money is just creating variables, integers, plus, equal, less, equals, blah, blah, blah. So you really learn to code while your pirate becomes the greatest lord of all the seas, isn't it? So one this piece, is something huh? that I really like. A little bit like One Piece, uh, Ruffy, Monkey D. Ruffy. Who wants to more become or less, the, more or less on that line. The, yeah, that's right, something nice. super cool. Man, uh, uh, so gamification is a topic that I came across for the first time, I think in 2013 or so, and thought this is this is amazing. I love video games. I would like to gamify my whole life. And uh, now you you are gamifying your courses, which is something that I've not um, optimized my courses for yet. I definitely am looking forward to doing that as well. Um, what what else do you gamify? Do you gamify your life in general? Like, do you have some other things that you say, okay, well, I want to achieve that goal, so I'm going to gamify this to achieve this goal? I do it in a lot more aspects that I, than I really think. For instance, for me, doing the shopping 
you know, having a barbecue here on Sunday. Okay, doing the shopping to get to that barbecue is a gamifying experience. You get the list, you do these square boxes. As soon as you check it, it's like level up, level up, level up, level mm -hmm. up. When you've got them, you get promoted, you do your barbecue, get your reward. That's, That's completed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is something that I do a lot, even here for the next courses I need to launch or the next things I need to do. I have my big board just with small uh, post-its over there. So I know exactly what I need to complete. And I don't do it just for a scrum stuff. I do it because feeling that you completed all the small tasks over there just really gets you pumped up. It's, hey, man, I'm good. I released a new course or mm -hmm. I did this or I did that. So this is something that I really love gamifying stuff. Nice. Do you do you have any tips for a aspiring developer, game developer, app developer, whatever, how he could gamify his learning experience of becoming that particular developer and getting a job in it? Yeah, sure. Typically, that requires, well, doing more than just one course. Let's say he needs to do, I don't know, three courses and read the book and this stuff, blah, blah, blah. The easiest way is just to think about that in like that, the small post-its on the wall and you just can uh, break them as soon as you complete one job or, or the other. This is a super way of doing that and it requires almost not work just to be able to see your wall and see, okay, this is what I need to complete to become a developer in, the, in this topic or get that work or the other. Even getting the work can be the last post-it to break and that's something that really helps helps a lot because you can see how far you are from the completion, how far you are from leveling up, like we were talking, isn't it? So mm -hmm. this is just a, st a stupid way because it's just going to the market and get one euro post-it stuff over there and one pen. And you can have a super good way of getting yourself motivated, getting yourself focused and see how far you are from getting that point over there. Mm -hmm. If on top of that you build with color post-its and all that stuff, you can separate learning from doing from curriculum for own portfolio from interviews five six different colors for different stuff and see how well you're balanced on each one of these of these things nice. yeah i know there are software that does this thing there's a lot of software over there like trello monday blah 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 whatever it is mm -hmm. but i think that having that in your hands being able to touch all that stuff having that on your on your wall even you know angering yourself and launching something against the wall is something that it's really good because this is the feedback you get in video games when gamifying an experience it's not always success success yeah, of course success, otherwise success. it would be a boring game huh yeah <laughs> in fact in video game this is the balance between learning and more uh, anxiousness and boredom mm -hmm. okay a video game needs to be right in the middle so it needs to be your gamified experience of whatever it is. It's making the shopping or becoming a Kotlin developer. Mm, nice. All right. Thanks a lot for the tips. I, I hope <laughs> I hope uh, the, the viewers will appreciate them. Gamification is, is, a, is a beast. Yeah, I, I think that, well, after talking to you now, I, I realize that I have to really gamify my courses as well, make them a lot <laughs> more gamified and uh, optimize them from uh, on that regard. So yeah, we, we can work on that. Don't worry, I will help you. <laughs> thanks man thanks and about the um the best courses that you've made so why would you say that any particular course is the best course so what makes in your opinion a course the best course i think that's something i cannot tell about my own course because it's what i tell you is your your way of thinking about your stuff is different from what the others think about you you yeah. probably think that you are the best in statistics, the best guy in the world, you know, all the theorems, all the results, all the exercises in statistics, but probably you are not able to communicate it. Okay. So I think that for me, knowing that a course is good or is not good, doesn't come from myself. It comes from the students. It's just yeah. asking about, Hey, what do you think about that? Reading the reviews. And also sometimes it's just a matter of looking through my email and see that people just write me to thank me. Hey, I got my first job thanks to your course, or uh, I was able to do that thing, and I got promoted on my on my work and all that stuff. So probably the feedback is the key. I mean, you can be 
the best knowing about one particular topic, but if you're not able to communicate it, to transmit it to others, that knowledge is worthless. Mm -hmm. And this is something really important. I, I tend to apply that to all the things related to developer knowledge and, and that stuff. For instance, there are always some students that write me, hey Juan, I have an idea, I want to create one application, but I am afraid that someone will steal my work. Well, man, if you don't communicate with anyone, that idea is worthless. Exactly. You need to communicate it. It's not the value you add to that idea. It's the value that the others think that this idea works. Yeah. So uh, this is something I really always have in mind because feedback from the others is the key for me. That's uh, that's really great. It even gave me another idea for a YouTube video that I'm probably going to record just after that. <laughs> and that is exactly <laughs> that, that people shouldn't be afraid to share their idea. Because I also had this um, this anxiousness at the beginning when, when I was 18, 19 years old or whatever, when I had tons of ideas, but I never came into action. So I never was good enough to really get into action. And um, I always thought, yeah, this, this great idea, if I share it with anyone, they will steal it or whatever. Man, people have their own problems, right? They have their own things that they're working on it. They don't even see your uh, your idea as being that overly amazing. Um, they they didn't have, or they don't have all of the background that you have with the idea and all of the things that you believe are so great about the idea yet. Exactly. Yeah, nice. And you, you talked about soft skills a little bit, right, just now. And... What would be the soft skills that you say every developer should acquire as soon as possible? Well, one of them is really important. In, in development, there's a lot of procrastination. You lose your time a lot. There are some things like, you know, having your mobile phone in front of you, reading the email, having a lot of external things that may distract you from your work. It's really a dangerous area. Not just because you don't do your job the same way, but because you don't focus. And development is something that really needs you to be focused on one particular area. So having the ability to, okay, I will work for the next two hours and I won't let any email, any call, any WhatsApp, any nothing disturb me for getting onto there. So this is an important, an important area. Also, being a developer means Googling, means stealing someone else's code from Stack Overflow. So this is uh, something that people that is not a developer don't understand. And I've seen a lot of marketing people or artists that says, hey, see all the character I was able to make in just this morning. And the developer is, hey, I just solved the bug. But solving that bug probably means backtracking your own code or someone else's code for thousands of lines and you just stare at the at the monitor looking for something and they just think that you are procrastinating so mm. have that in mind that this is a, a soft skill that you need to have and you need to manage but that the others won't understand by default unless you explain to to them also the ability to control your own work to organize your own work to decide how to manage all the files all the all the things related to one project or even working with multiple projects, that is something really important. And also talking about working in groups, a developer not quite often works alone, needs to work with other people, needs to work with a marketing team that is able to understand and sell your idea, needs to work with an artist that needs to make your idea beautiful. So that means that multidisciplinary teams are super important and have in mind that whenever there is a conflict in a company, it's not usually between two developers or two artists or two marketing guys. It's just between the different guys from different departments because one doesn't understand or even talk the same language mm -hmm. on the others. And I don't say that developers are the ones that are right and the others are wrong. No, everybody has their own uh, way of learning stuff, even their own way of understanding the emotions of receiving feedback of your work. And this is something that people need to understand that I know artists that you cannot criticize their work because they feel attacked. You're not attacking their own person. You are just making their work uh, be better. But that means that 
you cannot communicate with them in the same way that probably you would communicate with a developer. And this is something that people don't learn at the universities. This yeah. is something that experience brings you or talking with different people from different areas and seeing how they react, how they respond to the different inputs. This is the best possible tip I can give to, to all the guys that uh, this is something really worth working uh, on to. Yeah. Yeah, communication skills are insanely important. Yeah, and uh, communication skills help you with the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about. And that is how to build your network. Okay, so networking and socializing and really establishing a big group of followers. So that's something that you are doing quite well, not only online, but also in real life. I mean, you you invite people to your place and it's like it's you're, you're having a good time so we're not only establishing a broad network but at all at the same time a very strong network with the individuals so can you tell a little more about how you could well what you would re recommend in that regard to improve those skills to hone the skills to to even get started and why it is important to do that I think that for everybody, developers, artists, anyone, okay, can be the groceries guy, I don't care for what it is, needs to uh, lose the fear to communicating, to open themselves to the public, to talk in public. I mean, how many people do you know that probably unless you don't say, hey, what's going on, they won't say that first. A lot. There is a lot of shy people around the world, that they are shy, not probably because they are shy, because they don't want to communicate, they don't want to open themselves, they don't want to establish a communication, a relationship, isn't it? So this is something that it's just the starters. If you don't communicate, you will not be able to work in a small or a big team, or you will not be able to build a strong feeling for work with other guys, okay? So this is something I really encourage everybody to do. Grab someone that you have seen for the last days or, you, you know, you cross them on a hallway or you just came across at the cafeteria and just say hello, okay? That doesn't mean you're flirting. It just means you're a nice person. Hey, hello, what's going on? What do you work on? Or all these things. Because being able to socialize, being able to talk different language, not the ones that you know for sure, not talk among developers, not talk among artists, but talk about different profiles, different uh, kinds of person is something that helps a lot. And this is something that people always tell me that when I give a conference, wow, man, you know how to talk. People listen to you. Well, this is practice. It's just a matter of knowing what it is that you want to talk about, what it is that establishing a, a conversation. I don't have a script written over there to, to have a conversation with anybody. It's just a spontaneous it, it's knowing about hey what's going on what's the weather over there or what what did you do the last weekend it's just a matter of establishing communication and the stronger that is the easier it will be working on on small groups or on teams yeah so i, I read a book about uh, introverts as well because my uh, daughter and my wife are introverts well i'm not sure about my daughter yet because she's evolving or changing a lot she's still quite young and it was super interesting to see because there are at least in the um, Western society, 50% are introverts and 50% are extroverts. So for the extroverts, it's of course a lot e easier to, to do these things. For introverts, it's something that they have to actively think about and actively uh, develop systems for them that will help them to do that. So what's important is to understand why you do it. Like the motivation has to be big and you need to understand why it is that you would invest time into communicating into building your network and so forth because it will help you with your project it will help you to get better jobs it will help you with so many different things to to establish better friendships and so forth and that would be something where i would like to go over to another project that i wanted to uh, well talk to you about and that is your project Kendra the Moonwalker. So I'm going to drag in the Kickstarter campaign onto the screen now. So just so you're aware. So this is the project that you are working on. And this is the Kickstarter that you started, right? And it's your 
company Flyleaf Studios that you have uh, built this game or you are building this game with. And I would recommend that everyone should check out the um, Kickstarter and see if you want to back this project. You will find the link in the description. And why I say that communication and building your network helps you is exactly for those kind of things, right? Because it helps you to push your projects, to make them a reality, to make them possible. And having a community, I mean, like you having the communication to me or like us knowing each other and you building the relationship with me allowed for this interview. So I just came up with the idea to, to talk about your project in an interview to get my, uh, my viewers to know you and also like check out the, the, the project because I hope that it will be a success. And this is not uh, an altruistic thing because I also want to do a Kickstarter in the future, right? So <laughs> it's, it's really going to help me in the long term as well. So it's really about helping and at the same time being helped. And um, yeah, coming to the Kickstarter. So um, before we talk about the Kickstarter specifically, first of all, I would like to know a little more about Flyleaf Studios. So how does, did it come about? Um, what is your part in it? What are you? What are your goals with it in the future? I mean, like too many questions at the same time, but I, you're really good at answering many questions <laughs> at once. So, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Well, as you know, my main company, which I've been running for the last years, is Pro Games, which is the one that is focused on the online teaching, creating courses, getting some other instructors, working with them, co-instructoring courses, and all that stuff, isn't it? It's what I've been doing for the last about six years, but. At the beginning of that 2021, there was some ex students of mine that came to me and told me, hey, uh, we've been working on an idea for a, a video game we'd like to, um, to present it to PlayStation Awards uh, by the end of the, of the year and all that stuff. But they tell us that we need to create a company, to have a business plan, to have a, a projection. You know, and we don't know exactly what is it. Uh, we like the art, we like coding, but we don't know about business. We don't know how to run an actual company. And they presented me just some sketches, a little gameplay that they had for the things that they've been creating during the last month. And I really liked the, the idea. I thought that there was, there was potential behind all that stuff and that they probably can do a, a really good stuff over there. I don't say that they will run, uh, they will win the, the PlayStation Awards, but it was a project that, it was interesting. It reminded me of the Spyro or Crash Bandicoot from the old 90s, mm -hmm. isn't it? At least because, the, because of the character of Kandra. And I really wanted to help these guys. And I thought, okay, what is it that we can do? They will need probably some money to start, isn't it? To buy licenses or to pay... Uh, artists, developers, at least to have a little remuneration for everything that they create because until the game sells by itself, they don't have any euro on yeah, the exactly. bank account, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I decided to become one of the co-founders and the main investor over there. I lent them some money so they could start and I helped them building the structure of the company, helping them with the CEO. I'm the CEO of that CEO uh, of that company as well. So now I, I'm the CEO of two different companies. So I will not have a lot of time uh, from now on. And uh, well, I'll help them to understand that, yeah, they have the idea for a video game, but a video game at the end of the day needs to be a product, needs to be something to sell. Otherwise they will not eat by the end of the month, isn't it? Yeah. So this is my role over there and that's how Kendra starts. It was an idea for from them and they will just keep showing their stuff on the internet. Some of the people like the project, they joined in. Some of them didn't like the project or they thought that they were, that they were able to earn 3,000 euros at the end of the month. Sorry, we are just a studio that is starting. We are not able to pay that amount of money so it was just a, a matter of communication to have all the things clear like we were talking about and that everybody knows that we have a deadline we want to launch that video game by the end of the year and the ideas of the kickstarter is just to help us a little bit on the marketing to help us 
building community to help us spreading the word and also for people to get the game before anyone else on on steam we are planning to launch the game by the end of the year right? so i will say that we are about 30 35 percent of the development stage mm -hmm. so we have a lot of people involved it's about 23 24 people working on that project oh wow they're super passionate and you can see that from the video on the kickstarter mm, it's beautiful that the 3d models the environments the lighting even the music we have a musician creating all the music it's amazing if yes. you have the time to listen to the music it's amazing the work they they did for us mm. okay so yeah i think that it's a beautiful project the magical thing about that stuff is that all of them are are people between 20 and 25 -ish years old mm -hmm. so there is just two guys that are half more than 30 years old and one is me mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's just a matter to see that people have the energy people have the the ideas have the thoughts have the abilities to create all this world it's and just a matter of huh? connecting the dots the yeah. passion yeah. yeah this is something interesting and well i i have to say that launching a game is a difficult task and really you, if you want to launch a, a nice video game you just need a lot of money and in our case we were able to reduce it to just 25k on kickstarter and only if the game really works or only if the game really um is good for our people will come the version for playstation or nintendo switch or, or all that stuff but the basic one the the one for the for steam with just 25k we will be able to launch it to produce it to put everything and uh, show it to the rest of the world which is the final fault isn't it is sharing yeah. your idea sharing your war with the rest of the world yeah of course yeah, I mean, what what is a game if it's not played, right? I mean, it, in the end, it has to be played, and otherwise, it's it doesn't have have a value, right? So yes, that was one of my first ideas when I jumped on the on the board with these guys. I need to enjoy that game. I mean, I don't want to buy that game for ten dollars and then you know become an, a, another box on my shelf, okay, or another game on my Steam account. I really want to enjoy it. I want a story. I want a gameplay. I want something that people enjoy. I don't want people to remember Flyleaf Studio for uh, one game that was not enjoyable. I want them to enjoy our first game. And for sure, if that first one works, there will be a second one and a third one. We have a business plan for a long-term relationship with these guys. So the idea is that this studio will be able to grow as soon as our projects start becoming successfully. So I I think that now is the moment to push. Wow, nice. Well, I wish you all the best with that Kickstarter campaign. Let me show it once again real quick. So here, Kendra the Moonwalker. Definitely check out the video. It's beautiful. It's uh, The atmosphere is great. I love it. I love the artwork. Really, uh, also, if the guys who uh, work on this project uh, see this video, great job. And I'm really excited to see when it comes out. And uh, I haven't backed it yet. I will back it as well. <laughs> I just uh, nice. didn't get to it. I'm really looking forward to, to checking it out. It also gave me a little bit of this feeling of uh, this Microsoft game. What's it? Uh, this uh, where you have this um, white shining um, fairy. Well, whatever. That's all right. So um, what it would also uh, came to mind is you have 24 people in this team so how do you manage a team of 24 people while also running a udemy business or a course business <laughs> that's the million dollar question yeah. isn't it no you need to delegate a lot i mean uh i am just joining them for the the meetings on mondays mm -hmm. and over there there is one guy that I really trust a lot and uh, is the one making the product decisions in that case or coordinating the, the development area and the, the marketing area. And from that is a pyram pyramidal structure. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just the, the face that gives the interviews or that talks about the project that is able to make sure that everybody is on the same page, on the same line. But then there are the, the artists or the animators or the programmers, the marketing guys that 
push all the work forward. Okay, so for me, it's just a matter of guiding them on the on the correct line and help them with my experience or my knowledge or my my yeah my background on all these topics to make sure that this project is is a success nice all right well yeah uh, all the best with that 24 people is, is a real team considering yeah. that also seeing that it, the goal is just 25 uh, k like uh, at least the one on kickstarter um yeah. I'm, I see that it's already at 44%, so it's likely that it will uh, get to, uh, to that. And what I really love about Kickstarter are the stretch goals. Because once you reach the, the main goal, all of those stretch goals just make the whole project so much nicer and so much better. So I hope that uh, some of them will hit. So I would love to, to play the Nintendo Switch port. Of course, you have to get, hit 65K with it uh, to get there. It's not impossible, it's right? More, more money over there, but don't worry. <laughs> yeah. We'll try to go. Yeah. All right. And uh, hopefully this will not be the first, the last game of uh, Flyleaf Studios. So uh, as you said, it depends on, on the success, of course. In the end of the day, oh, passion is something that is important, but the, the money has to come in as well. We have to be fed. We have to pay our rent and stuff like that, right? That's why uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult to actually make a successful game than make a game you know like just building a game is is a, is a guaranteed thing you can guarantee that you will finish a game if you work on it but you can never guarantee that something will be a success you can do whatever yeah. it is in your hands and whatever is possible to you to make it a success but yeah many people don't don't understand how important marketing and pr and all of those kind of things are and things such as this interview for example to promote yeah. such a project and and those kind of things so what are the overall or the general tips that you can give anyone who wants to start a well wants to build a game an indie game or potentially even build a, a small company around it so first of all a one-man company maybe you could talk a little bit about how to build a game as a one-man company and, and try to make a, a living off of it if you have ideas on that and then the other thing would be um, how to build something as a team so what what would be the things that you need to consider when building a game as a team what kind of people do you need mm -hmm. and how what kind of general tips do you have in terms of marketing and structuring the project properly and so forth and, and expectations as well? Yeah, the first and most important thing is that the beginning is really tough because you need money, as you mentioned. In that case, the Kickstarter is a way to getting some money over there. But in that case, the founding for the studio itself, it just came 100% for me. So for, for me, it was just a, a poker bet for me. <laughs> it just, okay, I trust these guys. I will just lend them the money and their business angel and, and see how far are they able to push. So far, they've been working quite uh, really good. And that way, they've been able to earn a little money, get paid for their work. And hopefully with the Kickstarter, they will have a lot more room for growth, for marketing, for expansion and, and all these things, isn't it? Also, if, if you are working on yourself, I won't say this is a problem, but this is a matter of management. Because if you put your money in your game, if you put your time on your game, if you put your all your effort on your game, how far are you able to push? I mean, will you expend $500, $1,000, $10,000, one million dollars? How much money will you put on your on your creation if it's just yourself? Okay, and this is something that people need to balance. For instance, if I tell you that you will be creating a game for, for one month, okay? Nine to five job, developing your game, just by yourself or there at your home. How much money are you able, uh, will you be able to, to put on that game? Let's say on marketing, on PR, on interviews, on appearing on TV, on the newspaper. I don't care for what it is. How much money? This is something that people need to, to evaluate because... The balance between time and money, it's really difficult to establish. And at the beginning, if it, it's even more complicated because, I mean, if you will be working in a, in a development like Andra for nine months, probably for the studio, we will only be able to pay you, I don't know, 3K, 4K, which is not a lot for nine months of development, isn't it? But if it's an idea that you want to push forward, that you really 
want to bring to life that it's not just your model in your head or on your art station, probably this 3K, 4K means a lot more than the money themselves, isn't it? Because it's the idea going live. And it's a balance that is really difficult to establish, okay? For, for yourself, and whenever you open that to the rest of the world or you grab to a, a team to give the idea into life, this is something really important as well. Because one of the first things I ask the, the guys that now are part of Kendra is, why you want to be in that studio? What is it that you want the studio to do for you? Because it's, if it's making money, having a job, blah, 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 probably it's not what we look into a studio that is starting. We are looking for people that want to push forward, that have the energy, that have the passion to create this world. So for me, always when I, when I do one, one interview or one conference for a university, I never ask, how much will you pay me? No. Never. If they pay me, that's okay. If they don't pay me, well, for me, the passion, the energy, what I get from them to see their faces and all that stuff, for me, it's enough. If I put the money on top of everything, probably I would have lost my passion a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, and need to remember what I told you. When, when I left the company, I was earning a lot of money at the video game company here in Mallorca. And I left because an, a course in Udemy let me win 100 euros a month, which is nothing. Okay, and I left it 100%. So this is something that people need to have in life, that the passion, what it is that you want to work into, it's super important. And that leads you to your second question. When you work with more people, you need to be sure that these people are really worth it, that they are not over there because they want to win money or they want to have a nine to five job and that's it, end of story. You are willing to know that these people will have the energy, will have the strength, will have the ability even will have the willing to confront you when the moment comes about taking a decision that they will stand on their model on their creation on their gameplay against me doing the bad guy trying to uh, make it more commercial or making it more beautiful or making it whatever it is at the end of the day a conversation between 24 people it's really complicated mm -hmm. and i need to say that there's a lot of people that just comes out from studying the, their degree and they just want to work at a studio like that. And it's amazing to see their passion. I mean, they're just guys that finish uh, their degrees, modeling, animating, coding. And instead, you know, of going to a big company to do their practice, to do their interns for six months, like, I don't know, Ikea or something like that, or Home Depot, they prefer coming here uh, making a model for a 3D video game rather than going over there and, you know, designing a chair or designing a table, whatever, mm. the, o over there. And this is, again, we're going to the same place. Passion, okay? It's the willingness that, okay, I want to make that concept to life. I want to bring that game to Nintendo Switch or whatever. I think this is really important that you don't need to evaluate the people for, for what is it that they want to earn, you need to evaluate them for their passion on the on their work, and this is a a castle that's being built one step at a time. So that means that everybody is part of the project, and everybody is is proud of having Kendra on their portfolio. So mm. for me, that's that's amazing. All right, man. I wish you really all the best with this uh, <laughs> with this project because it's it's just so cool. It's really something that many people dream of, but they they, they might have the passion, but they uh, lack the um, energy to really also try things that they are afraid of trying and they're afraid of failing. And that is something that people m cannot be if they want to make such a thing, right? They may, they need to be afraid, uh, fine to be afraid, but also just do it. Just keep on pushing forward. There will be always new challenges because the thing is you, you have to see it like an engineer who's developing something. So you're, you're coding a game, right? And then you come across one problem after the other. But every single time that you come across a new problem, you fix it. And that's more or less the same thing, but it's outside of programming. So it's, um, let's say, the marketing thing. You don't know how to put something on Kickstarter. Well, learn it. It's a new challenge that you can fix. It's a new mm -hmm. bug that you can fix, right? So it's more or less the same thing. Of course, there's a, there are a lot of things that you can do wrong. I also ran a Kickstarter a couple of years ago, four years ago, I think, or maybe three years ago, 
and it failed. I it wasn't a success. I had this, I set a goal. I think at five thousand, and I reached uh, three and a half or so. And um, yeah, I learned a lot from this failure. I uh, unfortunately I didn't try one again, but I'm really definitely planning on uh, running another Kickstarter by the end of this year. All right. So, so it's, it's what we were talking before. If you don't try it or if you don't show it to the world, you never know if if it's really worth it. OK, probably I don't know. We think that Kendra is a good project. But again, if this is our idea until we created the website, until we created the Kickstarter, the video and all that stuff, we don't we don't we didn't see if the project was really welcome for all the people around the world. And well, it seems that it's a nice project. It seems that all the local TVs and radios and all this, all the media that I was able to go and talk about that project, they really liked the, the idea and all these things. And only being over there, only showing that project to the rest of the world, despite the Kickstarter uh, finishes well or not, whatever it is, it's a point on us because we are not afraid of showing our work to the rest of the world and being decisive for that and also improving. I don't know if the Kickstarter doesn't succeed. Well, that only means that probably the project, instead of having six, seven worlds, it will have two or three, whatever it is that we are able to build with the money we have so far mm. or with the willingness that these people have over there. Uh, and the project will try to go live and see if it's really worth it of, of the people's criticism over there. Yeah. All right. So then, well, the thing is, we are at around an hour uh, mark. Are there any <laughs> particular things that you would like to, to uh, share with my viewers or with the viewers of this video in general? No, I think that th there is one thing we haven't talked today about, and it's really worth uh, mentioning that because of what we were talking, and it's the fear of the, um, the fear to the failure. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, no, two years ago, I had the chance to, to give a TED talk and the topic was three big failures of my life. That's it. Super simple. Three things where I failed and well, I, I won't spoil your people. They will have to see the, the video if they want. It's in Spanish, but it's just a matter to see that if a person like me is willing to go over there and talk about their failures and I feel proud about my failures, people need to be, uh, to be really passionate about the things that they did in their in their past and were not succeeding like your kickstarter for instance for telling something isn't it so this is super interesting because uh if you are able to talk about your failures of the past imagine how we, you will talk about your success over there so this is something to have in mind that if we are here nowadays if today we are having this interview over there it's probably not just because of our successes in the past, but also about our failures and why did we change one way or the other at that difficult moment. This is the difficult moments that when shared with other people, we are able to establish a connection or we are able to think, okay, if that guy was able to do that in the bad moments, why I won't be able to do something similar? So this is something I really like your, your experience and even you to explore, feel really good about your your failures of the past because that will lead to your success in the future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've, I, it feels like I'm, so I, I have this visual representation of getting better at something. And that is, if you are constantly pushing and constantly learning and trying to get better, it is that you are falling up the chairs. <laughs> uh, the, the, the stairs I mean up the stairs you know like you're falling up each uh, each step and it's like you're, you're falling all the time but you're just a tiny bit higher than you were before because you're learning from the failure that you had there and this makes you overall more resilient and will help you with your future projects so whatever you're doing right because you know how not to do it that's another way of knowing how not to do it and while you learned how not to do it you learned a lot of things that went well right all right, man. Thank you very much for the interview. It was really a pleasure. I'm super happy about uh, having had uh, my first interview with 
you who had so many different uh, good insights. And um, yeah, I hope that my viewers will also appreciate it. I wish you a nice day and all the best with the Kickstarter. And once again, guys, check out the Kickstarter. You can find the link in the description below. Kendra, the Moonwalker. All right, Juan, talk to you soon. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.